I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jean Heilig. Jean Heilig works with me at the Colorado State Library, and she is the fiscal officer for the State Library. And she has done so. Thank you, Christine. Sleep. One of the things you'll learn about me is that the topics that I choose for doing my presentations are always ones that I probably need a little bit of help on myself, and that's definitely sleep. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that keep us awake at night and what we can do about it going forward. Um, it's really kind of interesting because over the last um, over the last several years, um, we've seen a change in trends where we've lost about an hour and a half to two hours of sleep on average. And that's been over the last 30 years. So it's really getting to be um, a bigger and bigger issue with people. And one thing I wanted to tell you, too, is that if you do have a technical question for Christine, give her a couple of minutes because she may be taking a nap. She's a napper. I like this quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald because it's true. I mean, everybody's um, the sleep issues are very different from everybody else's. One thing I wanted to bring to your um, attention is, you know, not only are we doing this webinar so that to help improve yourself and your own sleep issues, but you know, since we all work in libraries, it's something that we can also bring to the attention of our patrons in the libraries. For example, this year the Sleep Awareness Week um, for 2018 was between Mar was on March 11th through the 17th, and write this date down for Mar for 2019. The date's going to be March 3rd through the 10th. So it's something that you can think about whether you want to do any kind of programming around sleep awareness or do um, in-library displays to just kind of bring um, the attention to your patrons. Two simple outcomes. We're going to learn about why sleep is so important, and we're going to talk about how, what we can do to get a better night's sleep. So how much sleep do you really need? Um, if you um, look at this chart, this is from the, um, oh, it's from About Sleep, about from, it's from the Department of, um, okay, I just lost my train of thinking. I'm sorry, this is from the government, where they've given us some information about ages and sleeping. And one thing that you'll take note about are the school age kids. It's saying that they need tw 9 to 12 hours of sleep. Um, per evening, per 24-hour period. And I don't know, I'm sure um, wherever you're logging in from, it's really been a lot in the news lately about when children are starting school in the mornings. And actually, some school districts have started changing and tweaking those hours a little bit so that kids are coming in a little bit later than early, early morning hours because they're recognizing the kids need a lot more sleep than what we were um, allowing them to have by starting school so early. Um, also with adults, a lot of times we think that the older you get, the less sleep you need, and that's not necessarily true. Our sleep really doesn't change that much. Our sleep needs really don't change that much as we get older. If you go to this website, too, the cdc.gov, you can actually pull up a lot of this information for your own state. If you're not calling in from, um, if you're not logging in from Colorado, you can do a search on exactly what the sleep habits are for your state. What I did for this webinar is I pulled up the United States as a whole. And on here, if you're looking at the numbers, it says short sleepers. Now, short sleepers are typically those who sleep less than seven hours a night. And I found this graphic to be pretty interesting, um, where it says that short sleep is more com common in the southeastern United States and the Appalachian Mountains. But you, if you look at us here in Colorado and um, the, the um, northern states, it seems as though there's a lot more sleep going on. So, you know, you can kind of, you know, think about what would some of these reasons be. You know, I look here, it looks like Nevada is an outlier here. Well, it's because they gamble all night. You know, people don't sleep. They probably have swing shifts where they're working all night and trying to sleep during the day. 
Um, it, Alaska has also got um, a high incidence of short sleepers. And I think it's because they've got such long nights that it would be really difficult to have to adjust back and forth like that. Um, so, you know, as far as what's going on, for, I was thinking about Oklahoma. You know, they, they tend to have a lot of short sleepers. And I think it's because the poor people are constantly worried about either um, tornadoes or flooding or fires. I mean, they've been hit with everything this year. You know, and maybe that's some of the problems, you know, with the East Coast. Who knows? And here's demographic-wise um, for the United States of short sleepers. Um, of all adults, 35%. That's a big percentage. Also, women, um, men tend to be more short sleepers than women do. And you can look at the age breakdown, whereas, you know, 36, 35 to 44, 45 to 54 are a bunch of short sleepers. And they could have something to do with work and careers as well. Um, even by race and ethnicity, you know, and I couldn't even give you um, um, a thought as to why, you know, certain races have um, more, um, you know, um, problems with sleep than other people do. Let's talk a little bit about short sleeping. Now, there are, I, I put some pictures up of people who claim to be short sleepers. And they're the ones that are sleeping less than seven hours a night. And they say that they perform perfectly well, you know, getting very little sleep. But one thing to remember is if people are telling you, oh, you know, I don't need any sleep. I can, I can get by with five or six hours of sleep. It's not a problem. But really, true short sleepers only encompass about 1% of the population. Um, and, you know, one thing to keep in mind about uh, people who are short sleepers is they tend to be real drivers in the work environment. You know, they may try to set the norms in the work environment on how others are to, supposed to act. Um, for example, you know, I don't sleep, so neither should you have to sleep. If I'm reading my email at 10 o'clock at night, then you should be answering me at 10 o'clock at night. Um, you know, they also tend to be more optimistic and upbeat than most people. They um, wake up early. Even on vacations and weekends, they have a pretty set schedule. And sometimes it's genetics play um, in, go into play here, where they have a family member that's also a short sleeper. Um, and it's um, these people tend to be more physically active. Not always. I mean, there there's you know some people up there that we know probably aren't very physically active, but they also tend to avoid drinking caffeine because they feel that they don't need it to feel um, energized. So they don't drink a lot of it. So what we're going to be doing throughout this webinar is we're going to be testing your, um, I call them pop quizzes. We're going to be testing your knowledge on what you know about sleep. So Christine, do you want to pull up the first pop quiz? Now if you'll just select true or false on here, snoring is not harmful as long as it doesn't disturb others. You should be able to just click the box there on the screen. See, you guys are already smart. You already know that that's the, the answer for this is indeed false. Um, snoring can indicate the presence of, um, unfortunately, can indicate the presence of a life-threatening sleep disorder called sleep apnea. And we already had somebody put in the chat box that that's something that they suffer from. Um, yeah, but people with sleep apnea snore really loudly and wake up reportedly repeatedly during the night, um, kind of gasping for breath. And these, you know, repeated awakenings can also lead to severe daytime sleepiness. Um, and a lot of people who have sleep apnea don't have a clue that they have it. In fact, I've just encouraged my sister to um, go for testing for sleep apnea because, man, does she snore. In fact, whenever we go on vacation together, I'm the one who doesn't sleep all night um, because it's because of the... Um, of you know the snoring and the issues. I like the 25 sleep apnea episodes each hour. That's amazing, and um, that's a lot. Um, and we'll we'll um, you know and, and bravo to you for um, finding out about it and getting treated for it. Because those sleep tests are not fun. I've actually been through them as well. So let's go back to the slides, Christine. So let's talk a little bit about why we're not sleeping. Um, for the you know the first um, 
reason that we may not be sleeping is because of insomnia. And insomnia is one of the most common sleep disorders in the US. And what really you know defines, for example, chronic insomnia, you can kind of use a three by three rule. Whereas if you're not sleeping at least three nights a week for at least three months, then you can say that you actually do have chronic insomnia. And um, there seems to be a more of an increased prevalence of insomnia in women and in older adults. Why? I'm not sure. Um, the second one is sleep-related breathing disorders, um, sleep apnea. And that can be, um, you know, breathing is briefly and repeatedly interrupted during sleep. And it's a breathing pause. And it can last for up to about 10 seconds at a time. And a lot of times it's caused by the muscles in the back of the throat, which fail to keep your airways open. And um, what I've learned is that also with older people, um, senior citizens may have problems um, later in life with sleep apnea because the muscles in the back of the throat tend to start softening. And they're not as strong as they were when they were younger. Now also, um, snoring. We talked about that and about how um, it can be a very strong um, indicator of sleep apnea. Now, sleep-related um, issues. Um, well, there's restless leg syndrome, which one in 10 adults suffer from restless leg. And it can be very overwhelming and often um, it, it involves unpleasant urges to move the legs while at rest. Um, you basically have no control over it. And there's also periodic limb movements where you have repetitive movements, most typically in the lower limbs. And they can occur about every 20 to 40 seconds. Um, it can be brief muscle twitches, jerky movements, or an upward flexing of the feet. And then the third one is one that um, at different times of my life I've had a real problem with, and that's teeth grinding. And, or it can be um, more of a tapping or a grinding, but whatever it is, it will wear down the, actually the enamel on your teeth. And there are a lot of, um, there are articles that have been written about how to prevent teeth grinding. Of course, the number one thing is to go to your dentist and talk to them about it. Um, they can provide you with mouth guards. Unfortunately, I would find myself, while I was asleep, taking my mouth guard out and lay it on the side, on the bedside table. And if you sleep with your pets, you'll know that that is not something you want to leave on the bedside table because the pets will get to it. And they're very expensive to replace. Um, also, excessive daytime sleepiness disorders. Usually, it, this affects about 20% of the population. And that's where people will feel drowsy and pretty sluggish on most days. And um, these symptoms can interfere with your work, your school, activities, or even your relationships. Um, it's not typically a disorder in itself, um, but it is a serious symptom that can have a lot of different causes. Um, and for some people, just getting a little bit of extra sleep can alleviate that daytime sleepiness. But for others, it can be pretty chronic. So let's, um, Christine's going to put up the chat box, and let's um, talk about some of the reasons why you aren't sleeping. What are some things that you're going through that you think are inhibiting your ability to sleep? Yes, Jody, absolutely. Your mind won't shut up. I call those, shut up, I call those middle of the night anxiety attacks. And we'll talk a little bit about what you can do about that. Maniac cats. OK, Jody, you and Christine have something in common. She often comes to work in the morning with scratches and bite marks on her. And it's from the cat getting her during the night. Get out and using the restroom, absolutely. <laughs> Working at night, yes, that can do it. <laughs> Stress, absolutely. Thinking about work. You know, and these are all good things, and they're things that we're going to be addressing, too, as we go forward. You know, Mary, I have the same problem with every noise. It keeps me awake, too. In fact, last night, um, I've become a slave to my Fitbit, because it actually, they're not 100% accurate, but they will they're pretty good about telling you how much sleep you're getting at night. And last night, I only got six and a half hours of sleep. And it's because of the storms that moved in last night. Um, here in Colorado, we had a lot of electrical storms and heavy rain. And I was having a really hard time sleeping through it. 
Ah, spending time on the smartphone. Yes, we're going to really talk about that a lot because that's a no-no. This is great. Thank you so much, everybody. So let's talk about some of the things that keep me awake at night. Time change. The time change really throws me. And for whatever reason, the time change that occurs um, in the spring is the one that affects me the most. It doesn't affect me. And I think it's partially because um, the days are getting longer. And I have a really hard time going to bed when it's still light out, even though I like to leave my house at 6 o'clock in the morning to get to work between 6.30 and 7. That means I have to get up at 4. So I really need to try to you know, get to bed earlier to get in my eight hours. Um, middle of the night anxiety attacks, absolutely stress, um, jet lag. And it was interesting to note that um, usually people will su suffer jet lag when they're going from east to west. But for me, it's the you know, when they're going from west to east is when they suffer jet lag the most. But for me, it's the complete opposite. Like if I go to the east coast on business and I come back west, then it's a good 24 hours before um, I feel functional again because I just crash when I get home. Um, we already talked about noise. You know why I'm awake. Um, pain. You know, I have arthritis pain. And sometimes laying in the same position can be very painful all night or most of the night. So I find myself tossing and turning and moving a lot. And then down the lower left, poodle. Pets. Pets can be a real problem when we're trying to sleep at night. Um, I'm on my third poodle now. My first one slept with me. And I used to accuse him of being a bat because he was flying around the house and me all night long, keeping me awake. My second poodle, even though she was only 15 pounds, she wasn't real big, but she was very long, and she liked to sleep horizontally right in the middle of the bed. So I would wake up in the morning literally crippled from kind of contorting myself around her. So for my present poodle, I decided, because I knew how hyper he was when he was a puppy, that... I wasn't going to start that habit with him of sleeping in bed with me. And he now has his own room and his own bed and his, you know, his own comfort zone, his own safe zone. And he doesn't sleep with me, which is a good thing. So let's talk a little bit about um, the science of sleeping and why it's so important for us to sleep and why it's so needed. Um, you know, the, for the first reason is that it kind of helps to us to solidify and consolidate our memories. And as we go through the day, our day takes in an incredible amount of information. And most of this information is stored in our short-term memory, um, which is located in the hippocampus. But there's only so much information that we can actually store. So, you know, it doesn't go right into our long-term memory. But in the evening, what happens is that we start processing that information that's in the hippocampus, and it's moved over to the cortex, which is where we store more of our long-term memories and our long-term information. So it's um, you know, so it's really critical that we're getting sleep so that you know we're getting that information actually stored for longer periods of time. Also, night also. Um, Research has shown that um, after people sleep, they tend to retain information and perform better on memory tasks. And I read a study that I thought was really interesting where they took people and um, tested them based on how much sleep they had had the night before. And what they did is they gave all of them just a huge amount of information that they had to um, study and learn over a given period of time. And some of these people had gotten eight hours of sleep. Some of them had gotten six. Some of them had gotten four hours of sleep. And then they allowed some of the people to take naps. And um, then they woke them up. And some people weren't able to take naps. They had to stay up, keep doing you know, brain exercises, such as you know, surfing the internet, or um, you know, doing puzzles, crossword puzzles, or playing board games. Then they um, brought them all together again and just loaded them up with information. And then they tested them on what their retention was. And they found that the people who took the naps had a much better rate of intention. The, um, 
retention than the people who didn't take naps. And the people who didn't take naps, um, they just didn't have the capacity to learn anymore. So they weren't remembering things as well. Very interesting. And um, you can find a lot of the, all of the resources that I'm quoting um, in here are actually, you can get to the um, sleep resources that you can download from the website or from um, the chat box here. Um, it's Everything's listed in there, so you can go back and get more information on it. Now, also, another really important thing that I learned about what we do in the evening is that um, there are molecular byproducts of thinking that are left behind in our brain throughout the day, and these are called beta amyloids. And one thing that they've found in mice, and they think it's also happening in humans as well, is that um, during the sleep process, um, what happens is that the cells in the brain will shrink, and um, those toxins are located between the, between the cells of the brain, and that during sleep, the cerebrospinal fluid will actually circulate in the brain, and it flushes out all of these waste proteins that are toxic to our brain cells. And when we wake up, then the cells swell back up again, so there isn't this circulation going on, and this cleansing process is, isn't going on. And you know, you may ask, well, why don't we do this all the time? Why does it only happen at night? Well, it only happens at night is because it's such a laborious process for our brains to have to do that there's no way that it can also be taking in new information and everything else that we do during the day and also um, purge ourselves of toxins. And um, to give you an idea how important it is to get these ami um, um, Am these beta amyloids out of our system. These products are actually um, the substance that forms the sticky plaques that are oftentimes associated with Alzheimer's. So that's um, enough to me. That was enough to um, convince me that yeah, you know, this is really something important that we need to pay attention to. So now it's pop quiz time again, Christine. So everybody dreams every night. What do you think? Oh, we've got a split group here. Well, and the, the answer is actually true. Everybody does dream every night. Um, though many people fail to remember their dreams, dreaming it does occur for every person every night. Um, and dreams are actually the most vivid during um, REM sleep or, or the rapid eye movement sleep. And it's a very deep rapid eye movement sleep. And that's where your dreams occur. So yes, the answer to that is true. So let's go back to the slides and talk a little bit about dreaming. Now, dreaming is, um, it's really a unique suite of benefits um, to all, you know, to any species that's fortunate enough to be able to experience it. And they don't think that all um, species do experience sleep, the way, uh, experience dreams the way we do, although some of them do. I know that um, as being a dog owner, I know that my dog dreams because you'll see them, you know, making noises and twitching and running and growling um, in their sleep. So you know that they're dreaming. Um, but, you know, they're re it really is a gift to be able to dream. And, you know, what, what it does is it, um, it's kind of a consoling neurochemical bath that, that goes on for us. And it kind of helps us mollify painful memories and um, a virtual, creates a virtual reality space um, where the brain melts past and present knowledge. And it really inspires creativity. I mean, you think about your dreams, you know, it really does inspire a lot of creativity. There is one important thing that you can take from this, though, is that our sleep cycles are typically 90 minutes long, and there's like three different levels of REM sleep. There's um, the first one that you enter into, which is kind of a, um, a you know a higher level REM. Then there's a medium level, and then your deep sleep, which is your deep REM sleep where your dreams occur. All of this takes about 90 minutes to occur in the evening. So now, if you think about that, if you want a really restful night's sleep,
And let's say you wake up with an alarm every morning to get you out of bed. You want to time that wake up time to your 90 minute sleep cycle so that you're waking up at the end of your 90 minute sleep cycle. So if you pretty much know how long it takes you to go to sleep at night and then map out your 90 minute cycle so that when you get up in the morning you've just completed a 90 minute cycle. And I know that for myself I know I'm successful when um, I wake up from a dream or right after a dream. Then I know that I've completed my um, sleep cycle. Now let's go on to the next Whoops, I'm sorry. Let's talk about the consequences of not sleeping. We've already talked about a few of them, but there are a lot of um, physical consequences. Um, and actually, sleeping this less than six or seven hours a night, really, um, it diminishes your immune system. And it can more than double your risk of cancer. That's huge. Um, diabetes and inadequate sleep. Um, even moderate reductions for just one week it tends to disrupt our blood sugar levels, but it disrupts them so profoundly that we can actually be classified as being pre-diabetic. Um, weight problems. People who don't sleep well um, tend to eat more. I know that when I've had a really tough night sleeping, I really have a craving for a protein the next day, but it's nonstop. I mean, I eat like a horse thinking that I'm giving myself enough energy to get through the day, and that's not necessarily true. Um, also, people who aren't sleeping tend to have a more increased rate of heart disease and stroke. Um, it, what it does is it increases the likelihood of your coronary arteries, which are the ones that lead into your neck, um, that go through your flow through your neck, um, can become blocked and brittle, which um, sets you on the path for cardiovascular disease and um, congestive heart failure. We already talked about Alzheimer's disease. Chronic pain is also can be much worse. Your body isn't able to deal with the pain as well if than if you're well rested. Um, so basically, just keep in mind that the shorter your sleep, the shorter your lifespan. That's an aha moment. And this quote here that I have by Matthew Walker, he's written an excellent book on the science behind sleep. And I really highly recommend it. And that's on your list of resources as well. Now let's talk a little bit about, um, oh, is, it, is it pop quiz time, Christine? No, it's not. Is it yet? Not yet, unless you want okay. me to. No, it's OK. It's after this one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the um, psychological effects. First of all, people who don't sleep enough tend to have more incidences of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and which all three of these may lead to um, higher rates of suicide as well. It affects our memory. We already talked about how it affects um, how we learn, our creativity, our productivity, and also how, a, how um, able we are to concentrate on tasks, tasks, any kind of tasks at hand. So those are just some of the um, psychological effects. Now it's pop quiz time, Christine. <laughs> so no matter how sleepy you are, you can force yourself to stay awake. Who believes that? I think that's just about everybody. Most of you believe that's false, and you're, you're correct. Um, if you're sleeping enough, you can fall asleep anywhere. Um, it's also possible to fall asleep for a few seconds and not even realize it. Um, you know, it's these microsleeps we'll talk a little bit more about um, later um, can be really dangerous, um, especially if you're going to be driving. So um, no, you really can't force yourself to stay awake. You know, at some point your body's going to take over, and you may not even realize it that you've that you are sleeping. So let's go on to the slides, Christine. And and I think this next session is really important because I think that I'd be negligent not to talk about you know one of the major costs of no sleep and how it affects us as well as how it can affect others and that's by you know distracted driving sleeping while I'm driving while you're impaired 
um, you know, being awake for 19 hours makes you drive like you've had a blood alcohol level of 0.08, which is considered legally drunk. Now let's look at that a little bit. Let's say you get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And after work, you know, you decide to go out and have dinner and maybe have a cocktail. Um, so, you know, that's usually about 7 o'clock at night. Well, then a friend calls you on the phone and says, hey, you know, let's go dancing. Let's go partying. But, you know, we want you to be the designated driver. Okay, fine. So you're not going to be drinking, but you're going to go ahead and party all night. Well, here in Colorado, the bars close at 2 o'clock. So at 2 o'clock, you're going to get behind the wheel of your car and you're going to try to drive home. Well, at that point, you've been awake for 19 hours, and your blood alcohol level is just as high as the people you've you've um, been partying with who have been drinking. So, you know, are you able to be a designated driver after not having sleep for 19 hours? No, you're not, because you're just as impaired as somebody who's been drinking. So it was really an aha moment for me. Um, you know, operating on less than five hours of sleep at night, your risk of a car crash increases threefold. And if you get the, behind the wheel of a car after having slept only four hours the night before, you're 11.5 times more likely to be involved in a car accident. And 41% um, of drivers admitted to having fallen asleep at the wheel at some point, whereas one in 10 reported they did so within the past year. So think about the people who are driving on the highway next to you, and if, whether they've had a good night's sleep or not. Um, and typically, you know, actually falling asleep while you're driving um, it will happen after about 20 hours um, or more of no sleep. And we I referred a little bit to microsleeping before. You know, and microsleeping is, are those momentary lapses in concentration, and they typically last for just a few seconds. Um, during which time um, your eyelid will either partially or can fully close. And it's demonstrated in individuals who are chronically sleep restricted. Um, it's defined as getting less than seven hours of sleep a night on a routine basis. Now you think, oh, but it's just for a few seconds. You know, well, you know, a lot can happen when you're driving a car at 70 miles an hour in just a few seconds. That just a few seconds will give you enough time to, to veer into another lane, hit another car, um, overcorrect. You know, when you, find, when you jerk yourself awake, you overcorrect and end up rolling your car. Um, you know, there's so many things that can happen in just a couple of seconds. Um, so next time you're driving and you have any of the, you know, the alert signs, which are such as trouble focusing, heavy eyelids, um, inability to remember the last stretch of road that you just drove through. You're yawning constantly, your head bobbles, um, you're drifting from your lane quite a bit. And I've seen people on the road um, that you see them drifting, you know, back and forth, and they're not texting. They're not, nine times out of ten, they're on the phone. But um, a lot of times they're not, and it's because, you know, they are impaired while they're driving. So, um, you know, something to think about. Okay, now we've talked a lot about um, what can happen with us um, physically and mentally by not getting enough sleep. Um, but, you know, there are some repercussions in the work environment. You know, it, um, actually in the library, working with our coworkers. Um, you know, if you're not getting enough sleep, you know, to really help other people, such as your patrons, you really need to be able to understand them. And doing so, you know, may require interpreting their emotions on their faces or their tone of voice. But, you know, if you've been sleep deprived, your brain isn't firing, you know, full strength. And you're really likely to misinterpret these cues and overreact to emotional events. Um, you tend to express your feelings in a more negative manner and tone of voice. I know with me, I get very emotional. I mean, I can draw, I can cry at the drop of a hat um, when I'm tired. Um, people who have not had enough sleep are less likely to trust somebody else fully. Um, it can undermine your ability to be fair, which is really important in management. Um, it also can impair your ethical judgment and behavior. It leads to errors in decision making um, or being reluctant to make decisions. Uh, it, you can um, respond to stimuli in the work environment in a negative manner. People tend to become angry or outraged, making them in turn more likely to respond negatively to people who engage in punishable behaviors. Um, Sleep-deprived leaders are typically unaware 
that their behavior is actually causing problems. And I think it's not just leaders. I think it's all of us. A lot of times we don't have that self-awareness of how sleep is affecting the way we react with other people. So now let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, as um, an employer, you know, what can we do um, to make sure that um, some of these things aren't happening? And the biggest one is to develop a training program, such as what I'm doing with, you, with all of you. You know, let people become aware of sleep and how important it is and what they can do to kind of, you know, become better sleepers. Um, also, reworking company policies. Um, such as scheduling. If people can work more set schedules, they can make adjustments. For example, if your library is open late one evening and then you're scheduled early the next day, sometimes that can be really difficult to do that turnaround. Um, in my past life, I was in retail. And I'll tell you, there were nights when I would get home at 11 o'clock at night, and I would be expected to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning. And in retail, you never have a set schedule. It's all it varies. It was very, very difficult being really effective that next day. Um, Work-free vacations. Really discourage people from working on your vacation, checking your email, answering emails. You know, that's something that you shouldn't even be um, opening your email accounts when you're on vacations or calling back to the library to see if everything's OK. Um, I know we see that a lot in the small rural libraries. It's really hard to check out on vacations because people will stop you when you're in the grocery store. Um, also having predictable time off, which is the same as scheduling. You know, people can plan for that. Um, travel, same thing with the vacations. Also, a blackout time on email. You know, if you have a blackout time, it means you cannot answer emails after you leave the library for the evening. You will not read and answer emails. You are, you are gone. You are out until 8 o'clock the next morning. And the most important thing is to kind of, you know, um, implement a culture where this is happening in your library. So really practice what you preach. It makes a big difference. Okay, we talked a little about what employers can do. Now, let's also talk another, about another thing employers can do. You all remember friends. George Costanza. I mean, he had a pretty nice setup underneath his desk. This is when he was working for the um, Major League Baseball. And he had his little telephone down there and his pillow and his blankie, the whole works. You know, but actually short naps really can help boost your energy and help you perform at your best throughout the day. Um, and research has shown that afternoon naps can help improve your work productivity. And there's a lot of organizations out there, such as Google and the Huffington Post, that actually provide rooms where people can rest. For, and it's for that very reason. Um, my last employer, um, which was um, Jones International University, we were an online university, um, along with several other businesses that, you know, it was an entrepreneur that owned that company. But um, we had what was called a quote unquote sick room. And it had a bed in there, and you could go in and you could nap if you needed to, or if you weren't feeling well, or for you know various reasons. And it was down in the basement; nobody even saw you coming or going, you know, because there weren't offices down there, and it was comfortable. So you know, I mean, it's something to think about. Um, but you know, you don't want to be taking really long naps. You know, forty-five minutes at a maximum. Um, I remember getting through college on um, taking a 20-minute nap right before dinner every night. And it really helped me with that extra burst of energy to get into my studies that evening. Um, let's see. Um, napping, yeah, nap pods. Absolutely, they have nap pods in um, businesses. Now let's talk, let's pull up, um, Christina's going to put up a chat box, and what I want you to do is list some things that you think you can start doing right now to help improve your sleep. Kind of an action idea list. And then as we go through the rest of the webinar, where we actually talk about some real um, um, activities that you can do to help you sleep better. Um, take some notes on your action idea list. These are just things that, off the top of your head that you've learned already that you might be able to do. Turn off email. Absolutely, Jody. That's a good one. Limit caffeine. Yep. Don't read the news before the bet. Amen. That's so true. Nothing to give you good anxiety attacks over that one. 
And, and you know, Beth, we're going to be talking about um, your nightly routine. About get, We call that a sleep opportunity, and we'll talk a little bit about that because that was really an aha moment for me as well. Yeah, going to bed at 9 and getting up at 4.30. I've got to be in bed by 8 o'clock, Christine, or I'm toast. And I get up at 4.30. <laughs> because once again, we'll talk about that sleep opportunity. TVs, yes. And that's one thing that I've really stopped doing is I don't... Um, Watch t the only time I watch TV in my bedroom now is when I'm getting ready in the morning because I want to see what the traffic report is. Um, because I have quite a commute. It's about a 25-mile commute every day um, through the heart of Denver. So I like to see what I have in store for me, both weather and traffic. But as, as, otherwise, I never watch TV in my room anymore. Okay, that's, those are some great ideas. And like I said, continue taking notes to yourself about what you can do. So let's go ahead and go back to the slides, Christine. Thank you. Okay, let me go to the next slide here. Sleep hygiene. So we're going to, um, you know, the one thing is that the bedroom nowadays is becoming less of a sanctuary for sleep, and it's becoming more of a second living room, office, or a kitchen. I mean, how many of you eat in bed? Or, um, yes, Christine, snacks. And, you know, use our bed as an office because we're checking email or maybe we're reading materials, doing our professional reading. Um, and same with the second living room. You know, you, you know, have the kids, kids in bed with you. You know, you're reading them stories. You're, um, who knows what with your, what you're doing, um, other than actually using the bedroom for what it's made for, which is sleep. And, um, one thing that you can do to help your, your bedroom environment is that you can um, use an upholstered headboard because it kind of helps muffle some of the sounds a little bit. Um, your bedside table should be very clear and uncluttered. You should just have a lamp, a clock, maybe some water, and a feel-good photo um, next to your bed. Um, place the bed against the wall where you have a clear view of the door. And if it's feasible, um, the window can make us feel sa safer and alleviate worry that um, prevents complete relaxation. So you really want to um, make sure that you have a clear view of a window and not don't put your bed up against a window. Um, and a lot of times problems with beds and windows, you know, there may be drafts or it could be blaring sunlight that might disturb you. So you might want to use more blackout shades on your um, windows. Also, you know, I've seen a lot about replacing your mattress anywhere from every seven to ten years. It's a huge investment. But one thing that you can change out more often is your pillow. You know, every couple of years you should be getting new pillows. Um, we already talked about not watching TV or reading or eating or even worrying in bed. Um, your bed should only be used for sleep and, dare I say, sex. Um, if you don't fall asleep within 30 minutes after going to bed, you know, get up leave the room, go somewhere else, and try to relax because you don't want your bed to be associated with um, not sleeping. You only want it to be associated with good things such as sleeping. So if you're tossing and turning and feeling miserable and thinking about everything, you know, your middle of the night anxiety attacks, get out of bed. Don't, don't let your mind is, um, associate that with your bed. Um, keeping your, your um, bedroom at a temperature between 60 and 68 degrees, usually ideally it's about 67 degrees. Um, you can drown out a lot of um, background noise by playing calming music, but no lyrics, um, no words, um, or using a white noise machine. And you'll also want to use low wattage bulbs, um, like a warm um, white LED, and um, Make sure that it's completely dark when you turn out the light. And like I said, you can invest in blackout curtains or even wearing an eye mask. Um, and if you do have to get up during the night, just make sure that you use a really dim light. And you might want to put a dimmer on your bedroom light. Um, I have one on mine so that you, you, know, you can use a minimal light. Of light. And also, um, some air purifying plants in your bedroom really help a lot, such as English ivy in snake plants, or what we affectionately call mother-in-law's tongue. Um, those are really good plants for helping to keep the air clean and not as musty. 
Now let's talk about the dreaded technology. Yes, this is absolutely a no. Um, people who are really anxious about staying connected all the time are more likely to use technology right up, to, right up until the time they go to bed. But what we know is that the blue wavelength that comes out of these LED-based devices is really detrimental to your sleep. Um, you're not going to sleep if you're staring at a screen. And that can be with um, you know, your computer, with your telephone, with an e-reader that has blue light being emitted from it. And what it does is it increases the release of cortisol in the brain, which tends to make us more alert, and it inhibits the production of melatonin, which helps us to sleep. So what you want to do, and I know this isn't easy, but you want to turn off all your devices 90 minutes prior to bedtime. Maybe you read, oh my goodness, a print book <laughs> instead of an ebook. You know, and if you're reading an ebook, make sure that you have a print book, maybe a book of poetry or whatever else, you know, that you can grab and you can actually read text. But you'll want to do it in a soft light, not in a bright light either. Um, you want to turn off all the notifications because a lot of people, their cell phone is their only telephone, so they want to keep it in the bedroom. But if you do that, put it in the drawer of your nightstand so that you can't see it. Um, many people will charge their phones next to their bed. Don't do it. Take it and put it in the adjoining bathroom and charge it. Don't leave it next to your bed. Because if you have it there, you're going to be more likely to pick it up and look at it. Um, in fact, 90% of Americans use their gadgets within the last hour before bedtime, at least a few nights a week. So that's just, all of us are doing that. And it's something we really need to be more um, proactive about, is not doing it. Um, you know, and, and you can prep yourself for it. You know, during the day, try practicing not reacting to incoming alerts or notifications. Um, you know, and there are even, you know, apps you can use to help you with this. You know, don't check your phone every time it beeps. Instead, start checking it every 15 minutes then maybe go to every 30 minutes. You know, it depends really on how tied you are um, to your phones. So now let's talk a little bit about, um, do I know what app? You know, I don't off the top of my head, but I actually think there's some mentioned um, in the resources. And if they're not, I will get some to add to the resources. Um, some sleep hygiene do's. These are, um, you know, kind of, um, obvious ones, such as exercising. Exercising minimally, you know, 20 to 30 minutes a day. I'm a walker, and I know on the days that I do take the time to walk, I like to walk about two miles a day. When I do walk, I definitely sleep better. And on the days where I'm not able to get my daily walk in, I do have a much tougher time sleeping at night. Um, but you really want to limit your exercise to um, the mornings and afternoons. You don't want to do anything strenuous within four to five hours of your bedtime. Because what happens is it raises your body temperature, which makes it harder to sleep. Um, same thing with, you know, Bathing in the evening is fine, but don't take hot baths because you're elevating your body heat too much and it takes too long to get it back down again. So, you know, a warm bath or a warm shower is fine. Um, also, you want to increase your exposure to daylight. Um, the more natural light you're exposed to during the day, the more melatonin your body is going to produce, which will help you feel meal help you feel sleepy. So you really want to aim to get at least two to three hours each day. Um, especially if you're working in an office where you don't have um, windows. Um, usually most libraries are pretty good. They've got a lot of natural sunlight that comes in, and that's really good for you. Um, you want to establish a regular sleep pattern. Go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, and that includes the weekends. And once you start getting into a routine, and I do find that with myself, I don't sleep, but maybe, I, um, you know, during the week I wake up with an alarm at 4.30. On the weekends I wake up at 5.30, which I think is very acceptable, you know, just having an hour difference. Um, you want to um, establish some kind of a bed, bedroom, you know, bedtime routine um, where you can read a book. You can um, drink herbal tea, nothing with caffeine. Um, of course, you know, warm milk, gag. Unless it's hot chocolate, that's okay. Um, and, you know, you want to limit your bathing to about one to two hours before um, you go to bed. And like we already talked about, that gives you enough time to cool down. 
So now let's talk a little bit about um, what works for you. So let's put up the chat box and let's hear from everybody else about um, Twilight. I have heard of that app, yes. So what is what works for everybody else as far as your bedtime routines? Mine is actually reading a print book. It really helps me. I'll sit down in the living room for a little while and, and read for about a half an hour to an hour, and it really helps. Yes, deep breathing meditation, absolutely. Um, a little, some mindfulness activities before you go to sleep. And one of the articles that I have in there also says, Rain Sound app, oh, I like that. you may have hit the mute button on your um, microphone. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Thank, thankfully, Melissa just ran down and said that you couldn't hear my audio. Um, I think when we had the hiccup, um, I, my audio left. Okay, what I wanted to say was that I went to a lavender festival last weekend, and um, they had a bunch of vendor booths, and they there was a lot of promotion about using lavender to sleep at night. Um, you know, like if you have um, a lavender spray, you can spray your pillow. Um, with it before you go to bed or just spray the air a little bit or use the lavender scented lotion um, and of course I had to buy some to try it so I, <laughs> that's to be determined if it's going to help me sleep or not I hope so okay great let's go on to the next slide Christine thank you Okay, let's go on to some of the um, sleep hygiene don'ts, the things that you really don't want to do um, before trying to get to sleep at night. You want to avoid eating large meals. And I have a turkey down here, which is good for the tryptophan. Um, it's supposed to be great for sleeping, but you don't want to eat a lot of it. And you don't want to eat a heavy meal along with it. Um, spicy and acidic foods can also give you heartburn before you know trying to get to sleep because after all you are going to be laying down which can um, wreak havoc on your gastrointestinal system you know a light snack is fine but make sure that it's low in sugar such as a banana or whole grain cereal with milk or yogurt um, or granola so something that's um, you know pretty calming in just a small quantity also keep in mind that caffeine will stay in your system for up to 12 hours so limit your consumption to only drinking caffeine in the morning and give yourself a caffeine deadline. You know, say 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you're not going to be drinking any more caffeine or 12 o'clock. And, you know, really, I think that's something that you can play around with to what works for you. I know that I have nights where I can have a cup of coffee after I eat my evening meal if it's a, if it's a nice me large meal. And other nights, I'm wide awake if I have it. So, you know, you really need to see what's going to work for you. Um, I personally have been trying not to do any caffeine past 4 o'clock um, in the afternoon. I try to limit it to that. And it actually does help. Um, let's see, alcohol is a sedative. And while it can help you go to sleep, um, all it's really doing is knocking you out. Um, you, you, um, you're removing consciousness from the brain, but you're not getting the benefits of a natural sleep. Um, it can cause you to wake up periodically throughout the night, um, so short that you really tend not to remember waking up so much. Um, and it's also really good at blocking REM sleep, which we already talked about how important that is. So you really want to stop drinking at least, depending on how much you're drinking, three hours before you try to go to sleep. Um, and smoking, you know, for various reasons, many various reasons. It's not a good thing to do, but you don't want to smoke in the evening if you are a smoker. 
Now we're going to talk about those middle of the night anxiety attacks um, or getting the brain to shut up because it's so true, it's so easy um, to start going over things over and over, the things that you have to do the next day. Um, you know, you, so what you, what you want to do is try to think about something else rather than something that's worrying you. Um, you know, try to think of something with a story to it. Uh, or you or you can just, you know, instead of laying in bed and worrying about the issue, you know, what you might want to do is just get out of bed and write it down. You know, sometimes people feel better if they can get out of bed and just write down what their thoughts are or what's keeping them awake. You know, maybe do a to-do list for um, things that you can work on to, for the next day. Um, and then, you know, go back to bed and focus on your breath and, you know, kind of mindfully relax and try that for 20 minutes. Um, you know, just trying to write down whatever's freaking you out a lot. Um, kind of, you know, and sometimes it can be a therapeutic way of um, um, examining, you know, what's worrying you and what's on your mind. And then, um, you know, and try not to learn, try not, try not to try so hard to go to sleep. It seems that, um, you know, we all experience these issues, um, but, you know, if you kind of learn to observe and accept these struggles, then, um, you know, mindfulness strategies can off often help. Um, also, by getting more um, sun in the morning also helps, too, um, in kind of, you know, warding off those middle of the night anxiety attacks, and I think it has to do with the melatonin in your system. Okay, let's do another pop quiz. Christine, there you go. There we go. Most sleep disorders go away without treatment. How does everybody feel about that one? Is that a true or a false statement? Look at all you smarties. You're right. The answer is false. See, you did learn something today. Um, sleep orders, they don't disappear without treatment. Um, it can be, you know, behavioral, for example, you know, going to sleep and waking up at the same time every day, or it can be pharmacological, surgical, or maybe even a combination. Um, untreated sleep disorders may have serious consequences, you know, that, that worsen your health and your quality of life. Um, you know, and one thing that I did just mentioned, you know, could be that maybe the fix is a surgical one. Um, I found that that made a huge difference with me. I had problems with my oxygen levels dipping like into the 70s at night. I mean, it was awful. And of course, that affected the quality of sleep that I was getting. And it turns out that I had really whacked out sinuses. And I went to a, an ENT, and he cleaned out my sinuses. And I'll be darned if I don't breathe much easier now. So you know, sleep apnea is one of them. Um, you know, there's so many things that could be affecting your sleep. And um, we're going to talk a little bit, too, um, about keeping track of your sleep habits. So Christine, let's go back to the slides. I've got about two minutes to go through these. The first thing we're going to talk about is um, the sleep opportunity. And I referred to this at the beginning of our talk. And that's the number of hours in which you give yourself the best chance of sleep. So that, And what that means is the best chance is that you're in bed with your eyes are closed and um, your phone is preferably turned off and stowed far away um, because you won't necessarily sleep. You know, if you think you're going to be in bed for eight hours, you're getting eight hours of sleep. And we know that that's not necessarily true. And that's, like I said, that's where I use my Fitbit because it actually tells me how many times I'm waking up during the night and how much lost sleep I'm having. So use this as a rule of thumb. At least eight or nine hours in bed. Um, is what you need. And most people give themselves a sleep opportunity of only five to six and a half hours, which you know translates to only four to six hours of actual sleep. So make sure you're in that bed for at least eight to nine hours to really get a good night's sleep. And then next is keeping sleep diaries. And I've provided you with some links um, in the list of resources 
on some um, online sleep diaries that you can use and use this to track you know what you did before you slept how well you slept and how you felt the next day and this is twofold it can look you can help you look for trends in your sleeping but also if you do need to seek treatment and you go to a doctor you can show them your sleep diaries to show them what your sleep habits are like and it's 101 I'm done <laughs> thank you all very much for attending it's over to Christine